fie ni fie minia Long live God and my God Long live a baby mine One time Welcome to another edition of Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Cromer, and you're watching Diaspora Network Television. This is one of those episodes where you have a brother in the house. Uh, we've been on air for over two years, and this is the first time my blood brother has set foot in this studio. So I'm going to put him on the spot later. But... Like we always do, before you meet my guests, we have to go to the jungle. And today's jungle, watch out. In today's jungle, I'm going to touch on something that's been trending nationally. I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. Say, fix the country. I've been doing some thinking, and I'm like... What does fix the country mean? Today, I'm going to show you why that movement by itself is mischievous. Look, if my yard is weedy and you ask me to weed your yard, that's measurable, that's achievable because if I finish weeding and there are still some weeds there, you can say I have not finished weeding my yard. That holds through with every other measurable uh, mission. But fix the country. Have you ever seen a country in the world that has been quote unquote fixed? That country never exists. The developed countries are themselves not fixed. Fixing a country is a long term, it's a vision. And we all know you never achieve a vision, but because it's a target, you keep trying. So fine, if the, if the mission, if the, if the motive of fix the country is to get the government in, to improve, I can understand that. But when you look at the people behind it who are pushing fix the country, fix the country, I can tell you this. Those same people, if, if, if the present administration turns every street in Ghana to gold, put food on our belly, put a million dollars in every bank account, these are the same people who come back and say, oh, but we don't have shirt to wear. We don't have houses to live in. So you haven't fixed the country. And so when you look at this fix the country movement, at its core, it's, misch it's mischievous. Rather, you can look at a, a government, a party's manifesto, and pinpoint and say, you said you're going to do A, you haven't done it. So do that. That's fair. That's understandable. But when you come out and say, fix the country, first of all, you're trying to get people to jump on a bandwagon that is very, very popular. 
So you have to wonder if this is not a politically motivated move, okay? So today on, in the jungle, my take is that the very core of Fix the Country movement is mischievous, it's politically motivated, and it's unfair, and the people who are behind them should be ashamed of themselves. Pick on something that is measurable, that is doable, and that will be considered a fair critique of the present administration. For today, that's the jungle. Stay tuned and you meet my guest. What's cool, fresh and trendy way to know look? If you feel real good, that refreshing vibe oh, Satisfies you right just the way you'd like oh, Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? Oh, you different think special this advertisement has been vetted and approved by the fda hello and welcome back this is diaspora weekly my name is jermaine Chroma, and we are delighted to be joined in the studio by none other than a brother of mine hayford atacrophy ceo of national pensions regulatory authority welcome Thank you very much, brother. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing fine by grace of God. It, I mean, look, the, the, the synonymity between hey, for the Atacrophy and UK, I'm surprised Boris Johnson is the, the <laughs> Prime Minister and not you. <laughs> and indeed, I, I introduced him to the Ghanaian uh, community. Oh, you okay. It. All right. Yeah, when he first... Uh, uh, stood for the uh, the mayorship yeah. okay. of, of London. Okay. Uh, he needed black votes. Okay. And uh, his team uh, met with me, and okay. I introduced him. I took him to the first NPP UK meeting. Oh wow! Absolutely. But <laughs> why didn't you? Why didn't you? I mean, I've always had this question. I don't know if you've ever asked him. Does he have a comb? Yes, he says he has. He has a comb. He says he has. He <laughs> says he keeps one in his pocket and he combs his hair. <laughs> but he, if he has one, he doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then he asked him once and he said, yes, I have a comb in my pocket and I use it. <laughs> and but by the way, it's, his hair is everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's so sad today. We just got the news that... Um, President Emmanuel Macron, in a walk about somebody, uh, some nuthead, uh, slapped him in the face, and we're sorry to uh, to announce that and to hear that. Uh, but anyway, it's one of those things that come with the territory. Welcome, Absolutely. my brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Fred, tell us about yourself. You you know you're doing some wonderful work that we're going to get into, but it's not out in the public domain. But before we get there, we want to know about who Hayford Atacrophy is. And it's also good to know that you're a Kwesi. So yeah, Kwesi, Kwesi people are, yeah. you know. Sunday uh, one. Sunday. I, I actually, uh, well, I have a very, very humble beginning. I was uh, born in a, a small town. I would even say by that standard, a village mm -hmm. called Ofwasi Kokovin, which is very close to Bekwai. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in the very early days, uh, we lived in Bekwai. So anybody who asks you where you come from, you would say, I come from Bekwai. But my actual hometown is of Fonse Kukobin, which is about five miles from Bekwai. Okay. I schooled there. I started my education there. Uh, but luck, as luck would have it, I, I moved to Accra very early in my life because my sister lived in Accra. And okay. I was the only boy, you know, in my siblings. So mm -hmm. I was a bit of a tear away. Oh, okay. You know, so I had to be brought to a class. So you speak Ghana? Yes, I speak Ghana. You still do? I do. Wow. 
That's impressive. So I, I had my education at Labuan Secondary School. Okay. Uh, from there, I went to the University of Ghana, studied law, and uh, qualified as a lawyer. Um, but I went back to Kumasi to start practice. You know, okay. And incidentally, I worked with my good brother, Sir John, who just passed. Oh, and okay. He introduced me to practice, and we worked in the same chambers for okay. some time. Practice being in law. Yes, practice okay. in law. But I, 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 I love the army for some reason, I, and so I had to come back to Accra. To join the a, army? Yeah. To so you, I, I never knew you had military background. Yes, I really? do. I do. Yeah. Huh, interesting. So I had a short service commission you okay. know, in the army. Uh, and after that, I decided to... To leave? To leave, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to, to the UK? To the UK. When did you leave? Uh, why or when? 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 Actually, both why and when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, uh, it was, was to further my education, okay. essentially. And uh, this was in 1990. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, 1990. Uh, I left uh, to further my education. Okay. Uh, and also, that's where, uh, well, I, I met my, my future bride, you okay. know, was here. And then we also met up over there. So Wait, you met, you met her here? Here. Yeah. Where, in the army or through the chambers? Oh, no, she also comes from my hometown, incidentally. Ah. Yeah. But we met in Accra, you know. Even though mm. she comes from my hometown, mm. I didn't know her from her because she didn't even live there. Mm -hmm. So it was in Accra that I met her. So it was an old hometown connection. That By the way, did you guys there. see that all that while he was talking, the smile changed when he started <laughs> talking about <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, the, um, we met up in London again, and mm -hmm. then we started family, and, okay. and work, and, and life, and everything. And so, 1990, uh, you go to London. Um, I think the why, uh, you, you've gotten the why and the, and the when, but, you know, I guess the, the other why part is, Around that time, people were going to Germany, UK. Yeah. Why London? Why UK? I suppose also it was my legal background because okay. I wanted to further my okay. idea. And uh, I also wanted to go to the law school and practice in UK. It was right. just a continuation yeah. of, my, of my law practice. Okay. Uh, that's how. Okay, I so be, because I think the, the legal, the legal um, terrain, actually, the, the legal profession. It's more aligned to the British system more yeah. so than any other yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. So that would be the, uh, the okay. Reason. Well, very good. So when it got there, yeah, any surprises? Oh uh, well, the uh, first time you went to a brochure, Madrid brochure. What was it like? Seriously, it felt like a bit of a déjà vu. I don't know whether it was because we were a British colony mm -hmm. and the kind of books that we read, you know, in school, which all had some kind of a. A British background, mm -hmm. so you would see some kind of a, some infrastructure. You see some the roundabouts, the roundabouts, and, stuff. and then you feel like either I have read about it, or maybe in my previous life I had been here. But yeah. it was all because of yeah. the British subconsciousness that we yeah. had in our education. Right. So I saw the reality of it, and it really surprised me yeah. uh, why things I am seeing for the first time. Somehow, I seem to have seen them uh, previously. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, there's one thing that I, I've always been dying to ask um, residents, or shall I say former residents of yeah. the United Kingdom. On August 4th, yeah. 1974, yeah. you remember what happened in this country? Yeah. In your face, in your face. In your face, in your face. These kids don't know anything about it. <laughs> I, yeah. I got up that morning. <laughs> Uh, and I, we, we, where our houses was very close to the Kumasi Accra Road right. and Tech Campus. So I got up and said, as for today, there will be accidents. I'm going to witness. <laughs> and see. Not a single accident. It was very smooth. Wow. Yeah. And you could chalk that up as uh, there were not that many vehicles on the road as they are now. But how did we do that so well? Yeah. I mean, see, it was good civic education. Yeah. See, that time, uh, of course, we had our medium of communication, which was the cinematal mm -hmm. uh, uh, vans mm -hmm. and, of course, the good old GBC, yeah. you know. And the advertisements were in organ and 
languages. Mm -hmm. You know, I even at my age still remember the diction in, in of the yeah, yeah of the of the of the advertisements. Not even in 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 three language, but in. I can do that in Ghana, I can do that in Zuma, which I don't even speak, but right. it was because it was drummed, yeah. you know, to us. So, and then there were also times that they would, they would close the roads for, for drivers to actually practice. There were some places that mm -hmm. they would close off, mm -hmm. especially here in Accra, mm -hmm. where drivers actually practiced practice it, yes. moving, yeah. And, and and most of the vehicles were like UK vehicles, yes, you know? yes. And yet yes. the change yeah, with the steering wheel on yeah, the right, on the right okay. yeah. And yet the changeover, just like you rightly said, was so was smooth so seamless. because the preparation, the sensitization, yeah. the education, yeah. the practice, the rehearsals were all done. And 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 for all of us, you know, the, the, it looks like it became a national agenda. Oh yeah. Yeah. became a national agenda so everything every program that yeah. went on in gbc before or after yeah. there would be that. some kind of an education and so I, I was actually using that to lead into the fact that when you when you go to uk you drive in uk yeah and then you come to ghana and then you drive yeah is it confusing very confusing <laughs> i remember one day uh -huh. here in ghana of course in uk you have to go back to the uh, driving school again i mean even though i could drive in ghana mm -hmm. before going they would not accept your experience or your license or anything yeah. so you have to go through a proper rigor uh, rigorous driving lesson so naturally with your instructor sitting by you and going through the and and even the the, the nature yeah. of the vehicle yeah. was such that uh they tune your mind back to be driving on on the right right okay but the problem came when I came back. Here. Yes, that, that's what I'm curious yeah. about. When you guys fly from London and you land yeah. here and you get in a car to drive, that must be this confusing as hell. I'll tell you a story <laughs> where mm -hmm. my, my, my brother, uh, blessed memory, Sir John, you know, he gave me a vehicle in Kumasi. Mm -hmm. You know, he was, he was living in Denyame. Mm -hmm. And, you know, between Denyame and then the uh, Santas roundabout, mm -hmm. you know, because I was going to my hometown, and I stepped on the on the road, and I was driving on the left. <laughs> you did it. I was actually driving on the left, coming down, and I saw vehicles bearing at me. Then quickly, you know, I yeah, had to, and that's a wake up call. <laughs> it was a wake up call. It was a wake up call. That, so do do, do, well. do some of your folks still go through that when yeah, it comes? Well, I mean, it today? happened to me, but I believe maybe consciously. Yeah. yeah. And also, again, when you sit in the vehicle, yeah. because the the the, the steering wheels, the, the on, steering on, wheels on, yeah, um, you 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 realize that you you're using, yeah, you know, the wrong hand, and you think the gears are on that and side, then, yeah, yeah, you know, so it confuses you a little bit. Yeah. Of course, now with, with automatic vehicles, is yeah. is, is, is is much. What about much crossing the road? When you go, like after you've been to Ghana for a long time, when you go to London. The first road that you're crossing, which direction do you look? The, the instinct is to is to look on your right. Yeah. Yeah. The instinct is to look on your right. It's very confusing. Yeah. It's very good. But I, I suppose the way the mind works, yeah. you, you get, of course, when, of course, it's, it's a, a, a risk of the accident or danger. Mm -hmm. The mind works faster okay. when there is danger. Yeah. So your first instinct, you have a, we make a mistake, but you, your recollection is always very quick. Yeah. Very good. Very good. <laughs> so, um, UK. Yeah. Now that you're into pensions and everything, I want you to take us through the pension system in UK. Yeah. And and what lessons you might have drawn from there. Yeah. First and foremost, are you retired in UK? I did Yet. voluntary retirement you in did UK. Voluntary yeah, retirement. I did okay. voluntary retirement in UK. See, UK before 1993. Uh, pension was not very well regulated, especially work workplace pension. The state pension has always been, and has always been since Adam, mm -hmm. and it started from a retirement age of sixty. Okay. Uh, then they moved on to sixty-two. Mm -hmm. um, usually, is a woman who live longer than the men. So when they are, if they have less headache. <laughs> where the women are. <laughs> 
<laughs> when when they are changing the rules, they often start with a woman. Okay. So they would say women who were born between, say, 1952 and 1955, you will retire at age 62, while okay. the men still okay. stay at 60. Okay. And then they will move the woman forward, and then the men will follow, you know, okay. gradually. So, so right now, I think some women uh, retire at age even six to seven. Okay. Uh, men, many of them still retire at 65. 65, okay. Yeah, but the, the, the laws keep changing, you know. Okay. Uh, they realize that people still have um, strength to work and they have experience mm -hmm. and uh, people are living longer uh, because of uh, uh, advances, in, advances medicine. in medicine and, you know, and uh, better what lifestyles What about the benefit like aspect that. of it? Is it... Uh, is it also a two-tier system in the UK? Well, I mean, the state pension, so I talked about the state pension. Mm -hmm. Then they have what they call the workplace pension. Meaning the private sector? The private okay. sector, yeah, the workplace pension or the <laughs> occupational That's pension. That's the thing I don't understand. When you say the state pension and then you say yeah. workplace, those who work for the state is not on a workplace? Yeah, those are... Uh, even if you work for the state, uh -huh. your workplace can set up an occupational pension, okay. which you contribute. Okay. Because the British uh, state's pension, you don't contribute. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. non-contributory. Okay. Uh, it's determined from your taxes and, and all those things. Yeah. But workplace pension, even if you work for government, you set up your own pension scheme. Okay. Yeah. And they have a minister for pensions. Okay. You know. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and they would actually educate people on, on the need to have a workplace pension. Now, workplace pension retirement is 60. Okay. Workplace pension, you retire. So you would retire from your workplace, but you will still not have retired by the state. That's confusing. Very. <laughs> <laughs> but it works. And, and I yeah. think what's adding to the, the confusion is workplace, because wherever you work is a workplace. Yeah. So why is there a delineation between state pension and then workplace pension? I suppose the, uh, the, the state pension is very similar to what here in Ghana we call the CAP 30. Okay. Yeah. You okay. know, CAP 30, which was automatic pension that you will get so long as you work. Okay. I mean, the British system is far more developed. So from the uh, 1700s when they passed the poor law, mm -hmm which made uh, uh, people, uh, what do we call it, uh, qualify for pension. You know, every, every British, whether you worked or not, at that time, at the age of 60, you were entitled to a state pension. And that was paid from the taxes. Okay. The tax system was very effective. Uh -huh. So everybody qualified. But then they realized that the state pension was not going to be enough. And it is still not enough. Okay. So there was an encouragement that instead of uh, the state paying on your retirement, why don't you also contribute? You know, whilst you are working, no okay. one can afford it. Okay. So that you have two patients. Two. So it's so the part where you, your contribution, that component, is what is considered the workplace. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. All right. So now. Uh, you, you talked about the, the, the ages, and we, we, we're going to come to Ghana in just a moment. But noticeably, uh, the retirement age in the UK is 65 for male yeah. and 67 for female. For female yeah. In Ghana, it's 60. Yeah. Is that a right number for Ghana? Well, in the 1992 constitution, fortunately or unfortunately, they put that age in there. Okay. So in as much as the constitution uh, is very difficult to, to, to amend, mm -hmm. that has sort of become part of our DNA. Okay. But I do know that there are advantages and disadvantages. The advantages being that, uh, like the guys will say, mm -hmm. you know, when you hit 60, you leave the scene so that the young ones can also come into the, the public service or the civil service, you know. So it allows that kind of a roller coaster change, you know, for people, new young ones to come in. Uh, but on the other side... People, is, that, is that considered an advantage or a disadvantage? Well, for the young, it is an advantage. Okay. 
it, for the young it is an advantage and for a society which is very youthful mm -hmm. it is an advantage so okay. that new ones can young ones can come in <coughs> but of course the disadvantage being that the experienced ones leave the scene too early because at 60 people are still productive this is where people have actually reached the peak of their profession and they can bring the experience to bear and then they can also success plan for the young ones to come on board and in the peak and in the prime of their time they are asked to you know and, uh, to go and even there are some people like in the audit service in the constitution which allows them to retire even at the age of 45 really 45 some people are allowed to retire at the age of 45 and you can see that even on retirement they can still go and get another job somewhere and they you know so uh, i think that flexibility should have been put in there so that as uh, regulators of the pension industry we could have a national conversation about whether people should be made to compulsorily retire at 60. okay of course voluntarily you can retire at 55. okay yeah uh, but 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 uh, at age 60 is a cutoff. Yeah. Okay. But with longevity right. and other things now, we begin to ask whether that conversation should be open. Should be up. open. Okay. okay. When we come back, we're gonna open that conversation because I'm, we're gonna dig deep into the advantages and the disadvantages of placing the retirement age at 60. This is Diaspora Weekly. I'm joined today by CEO of National Pension Regulatory Authority, uh, Hayford Atakrofi. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Are you looking for a secured, serene, and gated community located in the heart of the capital city of Ghana? Talk to Waylead Company Ghana Limited. Le Jardin Symphonique is a gated community developed by Waylead, situated at Community 14, Sakumono, which is within close proximity to Junction Moor, Queensland International School, and the Celebrity Golf Course. Each home is completed with high-end European finishing. Our homes comes with air conditioners, fans, racing light in both living and dining area state-of-the-art fitted kitchen visit Whaley properties this Christmas period for an amazing end-of-year goodies such as gift vouchers attractive discounts on each property you choose contact us on 0240-111-119 or 0504-499-999 or visit our website at www.whaley.org Whaley Home is where one starts from. Uh, hello and welcome back. This is Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkroma. I'm, uh, I'm joined by lawyer uh, Hayford Atakrofi, CEO, National Pensions Regulatory Authority. Um, if you see my lips are dry, I have to take a sip. And if you want to take a sip, there's nothing better than specialized. Oh, my goodness. All right. So before we went on break, we we're talking about a retirement age in Ghana. Yeah. Now, what is the average age at which kids can come out of university these days? I'm sure somewhere in the mid-20s. In the mid-20s, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So at mid-20, you come out of college. And due to the unemployment situation, on average, people are going to stay at home looking for a job for another, what, three to five years, mm. right? Mm. So by the time you actually start work, on average, you're 30, mm. learning the ropes. So which means your productive work life in Ghana now is 30 years. Is that adequate? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the Pensions Act recognizes uh, the entry into productive world mm -hmm. at the age of 15. <laughs> <laughs> As to whether that is realistic or not. Wait, um, it's in a book at 15? Yes, 15. But the universal adult suffrage is 18. Yeah. So We're breaking the law. Yeah. The law says you can start work, you can start contributing to pensions at the age 15. Okay. And then retire at age 60. So your productive years by the law is 45. That is so... Hmm, what word am I used to for here? Yeah. But yes, uh -huh. you're right. Realistically, mm -hmm. 30 mm -hmm. 
is where the average young Person man start. or woman would you know, we'll start work. We'll start work. That is even if you're fortunate sometimes. Yeah. And so, thirty. Now the law says you sh before you you you, uh, you qualify for pension, you should have worked for fifteen years. It used to be twenty. Before you qualify for pension. For pension. Okay. Uh -huh. It should be fifteen years. Yeah. Okay. It used to be twenty under PNDC law two four seven. So if you worked for nineteen years and 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 six months and and you know you you, you retire. Wait, you give me give me qualify give for me pension. that language again. Before you qualify for for, for pension. You should have what? Worked for, right now, the law says you should have worked for 15 years. So, <laughs> and the book says you can start contributing. Uh, you, have, you cannot contribute unless you're working. Unless you're working. So, you're telling me, according to the law, I can start working at 15. Yeah. And 15 years later, I can retire. Yes. <laughs> well, well, no, well, you will qualify. You qualify. Yeah. So even if okay, so if you start working at 15, uh -huh. and then you decide to leave work at, at 30, 30, years, 30 old. years old, you can retire. Yeah, you, you will qualify for pension. Wow. Because you would have contributed, you know, for 15 years. And who wrote this constitution again? <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, the advantage of mm -hmm. working beyond the 15 years mm -hmm. is you earn what we call the pension right. Okay. The pension right is for every year you, you, you gain 1.125%, you know, until you get to 60%. So there is advantage in working, working beyond the 15 years. Okay. You get more money. Okay. You get pension yeah, right. clearly. Yeah. Yes. So for people who work longer, yeah. it, it inures to their benefit. Okay. And the minimum qualifying period is fifteen. It's fifteen years. years. Yeah. Okay. So um, now the, it, it comes back to the the, the sixty year thing. Yeah. Okay. We were doing the maths and we say on the average, uh, people realistically start work at thirty, and so we have a. A 30 year period where realistically people have to work and go on retirement. Yeah. Is that enough? It isn't. For me, uh, the more you work, the better the advantage of ensuring your retirement income security. Mm -hmm. It isn't enough, especially as pensions or retirement is a function of your salary. Mm -hmm. If you start working and your salaries are low, mm -hmm. No matter how long you work, mm -hmm. your retirement benefit is not going to be that great. Yeah. I mean, what SNIT does is that those who would otherwise have qualified for pension at a lower rate than the minimum wage, they are bumped up to at least receive the minimum wage. Yeah. So uh, the longer people work, mm -hmm. it it's has better. proven that it's better for them. Yeah. But of course, if your salary is good. Yeah. That's why SNIT will look at your three best years that it will use in calculating your pension benefit. Your three best years. How do you calculate? How do you ascertain that? Yeah, the, the, the person would have worked over a period of time. Okay. So let's say... The three best years. That's yeah. assuming that uh, the pension system is capturing... The, your the annual earnings. salary. Okay. Yeah, your annual right. salary. And and in public service, your three base years tend to be your three last years because it's a, <laughs> really? Yeah. Because you get salary increase. And and this is documented. Yes, it's do this is documented. Ah. Yeah. So just as you're getting better, you're pushed off. You're pushed off. Wow. Yeah. All right. Um this 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 portion I would like to really explore because I think you know uh, the practice of people changing their birth certificate, their birth date, uh, the person, I mean. I mean, you... I would even <laughs> take the words out of your mouth because that is what it is. Yeah. When people realize that we're nearing our retirement age, the energy is there. Maybe we haven't worked long enough. Yeah. We haven't they... saved long enough. Yeah. We haven't <laughs> saved long enough. You know. Then they realize that they will go to the lawyer and have a, a deep pool or change of name yeah and then they'll push back how rampant is that it's very rampant and it's not it's not helpful especially as we have uh one system of law that operated until 2010 mm -hmm. which is a pndc law 247 mm -hmm. and then a new system which is act 76 is started from 2010 going forward so if you were born before 1958 mm -hmm you would retire 
under the old law. And if you were born after that, you will retire under the new law. And what's Sorry, the difference between the two laws? 1960. If you retire, yeah, in 1960, you retire under the new law. If you were born 1959 and... and what about the one in the middle, 1959 people? What are they supposed yeah, to Yeah, they will retire under 247, the old system. The old system cut off at 50, uh, 1959 and then in the 1960s. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it said 1958. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, what's the difference between the two laws? The two laws are that you get your monthly pension and your lump sum from SNIT. Okay. The new law, you will get your monthly only from SNIT, and then you will get your lump sum from your tier two or tier three contribution. Okay. Okay. Now, if the system knew you to be a 1960 born, mm -hmm. the system has recognized you as retiring under the new law. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, oh, sorry, 1959 born. The system mm -hmm. re recognizes you as retiring under the old, the old law. law. Then you go and do a, a name change. change. And then and push it to push 1963. <laughs> so your monies are going to the wrong kitty. Wow. Your monies are going because the system recognizes you as... Yeah. Yeah. So your money is going into the wrong kitty. Meanwhile, you're still working, hoping that you will get your money will come to this new kitty. The system does not. So is it advantageous or it disadvantageous to change your data? It is disastrous for the people who are changing who their are changing their data, especially very close to retirement. Okay. There are people who have retired today whose lump sums are in limbo because they will go to their tier two and they will say the system didn't recognize you. <laughs> You were, <laughs> yeah, you were due to have been born in 1959 or 1958. So, so go to the, the people who are cheating the system end up getting cheated. Absolutely. Well, we will make sure they're not cheated, but there's delays. There's delays, okay. There's delays in, you know, finding where that, exactly okay. where their money is. And I, we have so many cases. Do you think this needs to be reviewed and a very comprehensive law enacted to make it, to streamline it? Is it well, time? I mean, it's education. You know, because you see, you, you think when you just go and make a deep pool mm -hmm. in a, some small corner in some lawyer's chamber, that will automatically transform, you know. But after you've made a deep pool, your employment, let's say if you're a teacher, the Ghana Teaching Service will need to know, your, your union will need to know, the controller and accountant general will need to know, SNET will need to know, MPRA will need to know. Now, it is only when because our systems are not integrated so you have to make sure that all, all those agencies are informed. are informed before it will go through the system why don't we integrate the system well. <laughs> <laughs> that is another story that's another probably. story yeah okay and so um a pointed question do you think the retirement age should be raised personally based on what you know I, I always shudder to make a personal uh, comment on that. They make me an educated one, a professional call. <laughs> simply because of my role as a regulator uh -huh. currently, right. my role as a regulator. Uh, because I have made uh, a suggestion before, mm -hmm. and the following day I made a headline by saying that I said... <laughs> uh -huh. you know, the constitution of the law. There's nothing wrong with making the headline. <laughs> the constitution. It's something that you see as good for the nation. No, what I should what I I, I, I should say and mm -hmm. what I always say is that we should begin a national conversation about it. Okay. Rather than the pensions regulator saying, saying this. this. Yeah. So okay. the fact that you say that there should be a national conversation begun is indicative of the fact that sixty is not a good number. It's a topical issue that we, we can all have. Okay. You know, it's a topical issue that we can all have because uh, society is changing. Okay. People are living longer. Uh, and, and then also there's a high rate of unemployment, yeah. you know, in the system. So there's okay. a balance there's between a balance. the two. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, NPRA, before you took over, what was it like? Yeah. NPRA was set up in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, I came there into in early 2017, so let's say they had had six years, mm -hmm. full six years of operation. Now, that's the first time that a pensions regulator had been, you know, uh, uh, instituted in our system. We never had one. SNIT from 19. 
1965 to 1972. It was never regulated. It was not regulated. In the 72, wow. it became a provident fund, and then up to the year 2008, when the law, this new law was passed, passed was not regu uh, regulated. So we didn't have a pensions regulator. And then to have a regulator come into the system uh, in 2010 to meet an institution which is as old as SNET, it was really difficult for the regulator to have a handle on SNET. Okay. And then also the regulator had to uh, license new uh, schemes, uh, register new schemes and license new trustees to start a new tier two and a tier three that the law had created. So it had a lot on its hands, you know. It didn't have the personnel, it didn't even have an office, you know, like this, you know, they were given some space somewhere in the ministries and they kept moving from one office oh, wow. to the other. So the struggle, they were up against a system which was already running. So the very first two, three years was a struggle for the authority. Plus the fact that there were a number of transitional issues because moving from a, a, a one-tier system to a three-tier system brought with it a lot of transitional issues. Right. So even before you started, you know, you were already up against, you know, swimming against the tide. Right. Um, issues to do with those who were aged uh, 50 at the year 2010 mm -hmm. who had to be migrated onto the new system mm -hmm. and those who were uh, aged like uh, uh, no, those who were below 50, sorry, those who were below 50 had to be migrated onto the new system, system, and those yeah. who were 50 and above had to stay on the old system. So, even demarcating the workforce was a problem, was a problem, you know. So, that's what you came to meet. So, basically. The, the struggle was there, and then from day one, when the new system hit pensions had to be paid okay oh my goodness yes so, pensions yeah. had to be paid uh, contributions had to be made yeah. who was to pay where would the contributions go so government set up what we call the uh, uh, a temporary pension fund account to put the money in who did it belong to it didn't we didn't know whether it was Jermaine or Hayford or who and who so that uh, temporary pension fund account became an arbitrage okay. on the authority okay to manage you're yeah. managing funds, you're trying to set up an office, you're now employing your staff. Wow. So I can it was imagine. really difficult. You so know can, I just want to paint a picture for you to know that yeah. MPRA did not have it easy. And, and you know what, I, we, we're going to transition to uh, a break, uh, but I'll have to say this. It speaks volumes about you uh, for an MPP CEO. Yeah. Going bending over backwards to be reasonable to his NDC predecessor. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Stay tuned. We'll be right back. As the national regulator of the communications industry in Ghana, the National Communications Authority seeks to ensure an environment that is safe and fair for consumers and service providers. NCA grants licenses and authorizations for operation of communication systems and services, develops guidelines to streamline communication activities, establish and monitor quality of service indicators for operators and service providers. NCA is in eight regions, Nakra, Tamale, Takradi, Kum Masi, Ho, Kufaridua, Sunyani, and Bogatanga. Do you have unresolved complaints with the service providers? Contact us on 0800 0307-011419 between the hours of 8 o'clock a.m. and 5 o'clock p.m. from Monday to Friday or visit our website at www.nca.org.gh and follow the procedure for filing a complaint or submitting inquiry. National Communications Authority Communications for Development. Welcome back to Diaspora Weekly. My name is Jermaine Nkrumah and you're watching Diaspora Network Television. My guest today is lawyer Hilford Atakrofi, CEO of National Pensions Regulatory Authority. Uh, you know that uh, that word regulatory yeah. uh, is very tough on the yes. Asante lip, yeah, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so uh, before we went on the on the break, you were talking about 
um, MPRA before your tenure. Yeah. And I appreciate the fact that you really were reasonable with your predecessor in terms of the challenges that he or she was facing prior to you coming in. But when you walked in, what did it look like and what's it like today? Yeah, when I walked <clears throat> in, the legacy that I found there was staff who were really eager to work. They just needed a sense of direction okay. and a new focus. Okay. Um, the, the first thing I decided to embark on, of course, with the support of my, my uh, ministers, was that we are not cut out to manage funds. We are cut out to regulate schemes and also to ensure that the funds are invested properly. So let's, we, we should take our hands off the funds and then uh, transfer them to the public sector schemes. Wait, you had your hand on the money? Yes. And you said, no, I no. want you to take my hand off. Yes. Are you a Ghanaian? <laughs> <laughs> Because the money was in, uh, in an account at the Bank of Ghana called the Temporary Pension Fund Account. Okay. So I said, it is not our mandate yeah. to manage funds. Okay. It gave previous CEOs trouble in the past. The money belonged to teachers, belonged to nurses, belonged to doctors, belonged to civil servants, belonged to judicial service workers, and public service workers. And so they had formed their own schemes. They had a, set, a health sector occupational pension scheme, uh, Ghana Education Service occupational pension scheme. Uh, we had a, the H, which is the civil servants. We have the JUSAC, which is the judicial. So I so said they should manage their own schemes so that I can go and inspect, I can they go can. and regulate, I can so, carry the weight. So more or less, you were an auditor, and before you exactly. got there, the auditor was the accountant. Accountant. And you said, no, 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 I'm not an accountant, <laughs> yeah. I'm an auditor. Yeah. Very fair. Yeah. So we, uh, we passed on, there was 3.1 billion, mm -hmm. which was in the account. We transferred it straight away. And then we said, as regulators, we cannot be paid by government. We would be in the hands of government. We want to be autonomous, financially autonomous. So I went to my ministers and argued for autonomy, which in the budget of 2017, we were given by the Minister uh, for of, of Finance. So that was... So are you at the Finance Ministry? Oh. Yes, we, I report to two ministries. Okay. The Ministry of Labour and, and Employment of... Relations because monies belong to workers. Okay. And then you also report to the Minister of Finance because you are regulating funds, pension funds. Very good. So if you're an autonomous agency, who pays you? We pay ourselves. To do what? You know, so you charge a fee to... You charge the fees... To the schemes who are managing the funds, they give us 0.33% of ah. the funds that they are managing okay. to pay my staff. Okay. So that that's was funny. the autonomy that I fought for. You know, that's, that's, very, um, it, it, that's very significant. Yeah. Because, you know, one thing that I am sorry to say that in Ghana, the right things, people are not... It's rare to see people do the right thing. It seemed to me when you came in, you saw that, no, I don't even want to handle the money. Yeah. And I don't want any conflict of interest. Yeah. So those are very, very good moves. Yeah. So is that where NPR is today? And yes. what, what is yeah. NPR? NPR like and then we said that, look, for the trustees who manage these schemes, what is their knowledge? What is their understanding? Because to be appointed a trustee and to manage people's funds for 15 years, 20 years or more, mm -hmm. you need to have the knowledge and understanding. Right. So we set up a pensions college okay. to train our trustees so that they know the extent of their fiduciary responsibility. Okay. Yeah. One other thing is to, was to move MPRA to the regions. Okay. Because as pensions regulator, you cannot just stay in a crowd. Okay, no. are, you know, because we have the informal sector which is out there. So we set up an office in Takrade, Kumasi, Sunyane, Tamale. So you just and, and, and just we are preparing to go to Koforidua. So know, decentralization started under your tenure. Under my administration, okay. yeah. And of course, our head office too, because our numbers are growing, we had to move from our small office, you know, onto a bigger place. We are now trying to, you know, put up our own head office. Okay. You know. 
So MPRA is now more visible. Okay. Very you know, good. And we have come back to our core mandate. Absolutely. Which is to ensure Absolutely. retirement income security. So you you're know. managing, you're supervising SNIT. You're yes. supervising all those other... <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that is one area because, mm -hmm. because uh, SNIT was where they were mm -hmm. and, and they, were, they are what they, they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, I called uh, John, which, who is the, the, the director general, and his team, and they've been very responsive. Mm -hmm. So we looked at the areas of the law that requires us to regulate them. Areas like indexation. Every year you have to increase pension payments for people based on wage inflation. Mm -hmm. You have to do what they call the actuarial valuation because we need to know the state of the health of the fund. So I insist on that. Their admin expenses, I insist on capping them, <laughs> and I also go for inspection. For the first time, MPRA actually inspects the books of SNIT to make sure that they are paying what they're supposed to pay, they are collecting what they're supposed to collect. Do you, yeah. do you regulate what investments they get into? Uh, that is also under Section 67. Uh, we collaborate with their board of trustees. And currently, we have a committee in place that is preparing a new investment guideline for SNET. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. You are doing some amazing work <laughs> secretly. Uh, I, you, I have to admit, when I called you for this interview, I didn't know I was going to be educated like right. this. Okay. But what's, yeah. what's, what's, uh, what does the future look like for NPRA? The future for NPRA, for me, is to be more visible out there, you know, because we have a... 85% of our population, the working population, in the informal sector. Okay. Now, if we want to ensure retirement income security, it shouldn't only be for people who are in the formal sector. It's only 15%. Now, our law set it up in such a way that it was the formal sector which, ha who, which have to have mandatory pension. The informal sector is, is, is you know, voluntary. Mm -hmm. So we, until we permit the informal sector and make sure that every Ghanaian everywhere has some kind of a pension scheme, one way or the other, mm -hmm. MPRA's work will not be fully done. Yeah. So okay. our focus is to ensure that people who are in the informal sector mm -hmm. are brought into, into the, the pension space. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's, that's a tall order. A very tall How are you going to have the KIAs and the <laughs> Dow chain sellers at the... How, yeah. you, how are you going to get them to I contribute? I mean, as we speak now, my corporate affairs team, they are in Asasewa. Mm -hmm. They are in Asasewa market, you know, doing what we call market activation. You know, even in the midst of COVID, we still had to take corporate trustees with us. You know, we have vans that go around, you know, in educating people. Uh, we have what we call the micro finance, sorry, micro pension policy. Okay. You know, and for our, our part, we have said to every corporate trustee that is going into the informal sector that the 0 0.33 fee mm -hmm. that we're supposed to charge you, mm -hmm. we we'll give it to you for free. Oh, wow. So that you can get some more money to penetrate into the informal sector. Oh. Yeah. So, what, what are some of the public misconceptions of retirement that you are aware of that you want to shred right now? The misconception here is that when I retire, I should live comfortably. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a the, misconception. Yeah. That's, that, that should be an expectation. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> but you see, uh, our wage system in the country is not really what you write home about. Yeah. So, I mean, you lived in, 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 in USA for many years, and it's when people retire, that's when they actually go on holidays and live comfortably. They, yeah. they can afford to. And sometimes when we also want something similar, but when people retire and they look at their retirement package, it's, it's sadness. There's nothing to worry about. Do you have about. any plans of, like, in the UK, I'm sure you have that, but back in the States, like retirees, there's uh, uh, AARP, and I have to tell you, the <laughs> first time I received my AARP letter in the mail, I got so upset. I look in the mirror, I say, I'm not a senior citizen. <laughs> 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 but hey, yeah. when you reach that age, you automatically get that letter. <laughs> and that, that, that um, qualification gives you like what, 15% on hotels and 15, you get savings everywhere. Do we have that kind of system we here? We don't have that kind of system here. And it is one of the targets that I've given John and Smith mm -hmm. that uh, 
when you retire, you should have what we call the retirement pass, which would even entitle you to have free, to jo join public transport mm -hmm. for free, mm -hmm. you know, have certain benefits to society. Uh, it's an aspiration okay. that we are working with uh, SNET on. Okay. Uh, we haven't quite got there yet. Uh, okay. You're right, that system operates in, in U UK, in USA, and senior citizens must feel that the part the, the that system they have appreciates played, them. Yeah, the system appreciates them. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, uh, during the time of COVID, there were some relief uh, uh, services that were put there on, on, on behalf of retirees. On the MPRA board and on the SNED board, we have retirees, mm -hmm. uh, board uh, members, mm -hmm. you know, who represent their interests. And all those things show that we haven't left them behind. And okay. even when they retire, we I, I truly believe that, that uh, with what I've heard today, I am confident that this whole retirement sector has a big upside coming and um, I'm more grease to your elbow. I've heard people say that rather than take money from my pay and put it aside, who knows, I may not even live to that 60. Give me my money now. Yeah. I want to send it, save it yeah. now. What do you say to those people? No. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we are in a society where pensions have had to compete with other Ponzi schemes, short-term okay. investments. Okay. Please. Pensions is not like here today, gone tomorrow investments. We know, I don't want to mention names, but we've had investments which have got people's fingers burnt. Okay. For the little that you have, you should rather put it in an, in an investment that is aimed towards your pension. Okay. A good thing about the informal sector pension is that you have two accounts. You have a retirement account and a savings account. If you need money, you can fall on your savings okay. account. But your retirement account is kept intact until you that, retire. That's, that, that, those two th those, th those ones are available to only the informal, informal sector. sector. Okay. Yeah, informal right. sector. That's, that's encouraging. Yeah. Okay. So, because they are the people who don't have regular income. Right. I mean, they will be earning income today, tomorrow. Yeah. They will, yeah. So we, have, we, we keep two that's separate pretty considerate. accounts. That's yeah. pretty considerate. And, uh, All right, right. finally, since this is Diaspora Network Television, and a lot of diasporans are coming in, how are you going to regulate the diaspora retirement? I mean, yeah. I have, I mean, some people retire over there and they get their money and they live in Ghana here. How, how do those play into the retirement dynamics here in Ghana? Uh, first of all, uh, we would have loved for every Ghanaian who retires abroad to come and live here, you know, comfortably. Yeah. Now, the issue is how they move their investment to uh, this country. I've, I've launched the Diaspora, Diaspora Pension Scheme, okay. uh, which some corporate trustees have uh, taken up. I mean, I know there is one called the Equintifo Scheme. You know, people who want to move their investments there into government bonds, you know, uh, can move them across it's not very popular because of course you are taking it from hard currency onto cds which are you know subject to all the vagaries mm -hmm. of the foreign exchange it is not really caught on but that is what we really want to encourage is it matured yet is it a, a matured system it is not yet okay. i would have to admit it is okay. not yet uh but i would want people to move at least part of their investment into the aquintifu scheme okay so that they can live both there and here okay. and then we can also get the benefit of the experience of people how, how would that work the quintuple scheme um they 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 have about seven investable areas if you want to purchase government bonds with your with your your, your funds that you transfer if you want to purchase corporate bonds mm -hmm. if you want to uh fix deposits mm -hmm. uh if you want a mutual funds or or even in a long term if you think you can live long term mm -hmm. you can go into infrastructure bonds okay yeah okay. so we have products here uh and your fund advisor will advise you on which of the asset classes that you would want your funds to uh, purchase into. Very good. Very good. It works. All right. Well, um, hey, uh, this, this has been very educational. Um, pensions. Uh, those of us who are still young, I'm a young man <laughs> still. Uh, so pensions become boring to you. Uh, yeah, it's young. a boring <laughs> subject. Uh, that's, for the, that's for the old people. <laughs> yeah, it's for the old people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, for, thank you so much for coming. Uh, 
Hey, Fred Atakrofi is the CEO of uh, National Pensions Regulatory Authority, and he was kind enough to take us through a slew of uh, basically uh, uh, stuff that we didn't know about pensions. I am more educated. I actually, I wish I was ready to retire now. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has been a great edition of Diaspora Weekly. My name is J Jermaine Nkrumah, and I thank you for watching. Stay tuned for our other programs. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. If you're if you're minia, long live Ghana, my Ghana, my Ghana. Long live the baby, my One time, one time, one time, time. So we come to the end of the fire. So we come to the end of the fire. I'm ready to have a tour. Ghana, I'm ready to have a tour. Let me free Ghana. Me man penny and wadi kano. Your friend on the plank numa. Me a mini mini sign up when the madia na your mama. I send back up baby na mente ya. Aya me ngwa ngwa. Here onu neje fan hundi. Get na raya sasuni. Aya wadi de ma ye. Moja na 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 numbi agunya de to ha ma ye. Edu me ne wadu za ye. Be ye be atwa zoti. Get na de me ye a me ne wa. Sana kuti pa wa mwana wangu tra abainka wa Weni minyansa seme 